I hope you uh, enjoyed the bacon this morning. Everybody appreciate the bacon? Yeah. All right. Bacon day is always a good day. Let's, let's pray, and then we'll uh, open God's Word together. So would you join me as we pray? Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this new day that you have made and given to us. And Father, we look forward to a, a great day of growing, of learning, of working, of fellowship, of laughter, uh, of so many things. And we just pray that in the midst of all of that, we would also have our eyes and our heart in tune to you and to what you want to do in our lives. And I pray that in this moment where we open your word together this morning, I pray that you would take your word, which is living and powerful and true, and use it to speak truth and grace into our hearts and lives this morning so that you might accomplish your purposes for your glory among your people. And I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. There's a characteristic that every follower of Jesus should possess. It's a characteristic that's essential to, to faith in Jesus. It's essential to a courageous faith in Jesus. Yet it's a characteristic that while all of us should have, it should be a characteristic that we're barely aware is even in our life. So it's a characteristic that's essential, and yet we should barely be aware that we actually possess it. It's a characteristic that in the first century, when Paul was writing to the church in Philippi, it was looked down as unnecessary, even with disdain. It wasn't something that was esteemed by culture. And in our culture today, this characteristic is also not esteemed or looked highly upon. And that characteristic is humility. And so today we're going to be looking at chapter 2 in Philippians, and as we continue our goal of developing an undeterred trust in God, despite the danger, fear, and pain that we face. Right? So our, our goal this week and, and is, is to develop an undeterred trust, a, a faith in God that perseveres despite the setbacks, despite the ups and downs, despite our struggles, and that positions us to handle the life that God has called us to live. And so we want to see this morning that a courageous faith requires gospel-centered humility. Gospel-centered humility. Now, on the surface, this might seem a little bit counterintuitive. This might seem a little bit sort of upside-down thinking, like what does humility have to do with courage? Right, because that they're not two things that we generally put together. We don't usually think of humility and courage in, in, in the same thing. But I want us to see this morning that a, a humility that's not born out of looking down on ourselves or thinking less of ourselves, but a humility that is born at looking at Jesus and who he is and grasping what he's done for us, of, of really understanding the good news of the gospel, that it will and should produce in us a genuine humility that will position you to be able to live a courageous faith. You know, a lot of times when we think about courage, we think about it's something that I've got to fight for. I've got to strive. I've, I've got to make myself or I have to try to be courageous. I have to try to have a courageous faith. But, but I want you to see that as we look at this text this morning, that courageous faith is actually found through possessing gospel-centered humility. That, that we don't have to try to fight for courage, that courage is something that God will enable us to have, that He will empower us to have. And I want you to see this morning why humility is so essential to courage. So Philippians chapter 2, we're going to work through the first uh, 10 verses or so, but let's begin just with verse 1. Philippians chapter 2 and uh, begin with verse 1. Paul says, Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? any comfort from His love, any fellowship together in the Spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? And so Paul, he fires off some rapid-fire rhetorical questions in this verse for the church in Philippi and for all who would read his letter to think about. He says, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? He says, have you experienced the incredible hope and joy that there is in knowing Jesus personally as your Savior? You know, he asked them to think about 
their, their relationship with God. He asks them to, to, to dwell. He says, have you been encouraged? Or have you found joy in the re- truth that you have been set free from the penalty of sin, from the curse and the consequence of sin, that you've been made alive, that you now have a living relationship with your Creator, with your God who loved you and who gave Himself for you? And then he says, is there any comfort from His love? And Paul so desperately wanted the church to know that they were loved by God. And I want you to know this morning that you are loved by your Father in Heaven. And all, all of the things that we're looking at in Philippians, and we're talking about living out a courageous faith, our theme verse, talking about living out our new identity in Christ, the old has gone, the new has come. All of that is anchored in and centered in the reality and the truth of God's love for you. You know, sometimes, some days, some situations make it hard for us to feel or experience God's love, or maybe you've encountered the struggle of feeling like you don't deserve God's love, that you're somehow unworthy of His love. Well, yes, of course, in a sense, that's true, like none of us are worthy of His love, but God chooses to love you anyway. God chose to love you before you loved Him, and He loves you unconditionally, and He never, ever stops loving you. You know, my my kids are uh, sitting up there somewhere, and, and I want you to know I love them, and the reason I love them is not because of what they do, It isn't because they do great things for me. It isn't because they're always well behaved. It isn't because of anything they do. I love them because they're mine. They're mine. And I love them because they're mine. And in Christ, you belong to God. And He loves you. And so Paul says, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from His love? Any fellowship together in the Spirit? You know, we had this incredible privilege of not just knowing God, but now we have a unique relationship with every other follower of Christ. Right? And it's one of the cool things that we get to experience here at camp, this incredible bond that we have as brothers and sisters in Christ. And so he says, is there any fellowship? Are you enjoying fellowship in the Spirit? Are you experiencing that? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Right? And, and that comes from an encounter with the Gospel. Right? Jesus was tender and compassionate with us. And he says, has the Gospel affected your heart so that you're tender and you're compassionate? And he says, if so... As we think about the blessings we have in Christ, then look at verse 2. He says, Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. And so Paul says, My joy, right? My joy that I get from God as a gift, my joy in Christ, is also experienced in you and your walk with God. So the joy that we get from God is something that we share with one another. And Paul, as, as a, almost as a parent figure in this situation, he says, make me happy. Help me to truly experience joy. Right? That, that my joy is actually tied to you. And he says, make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other. Have one mind. Let there be unity. Love each other. Right? Love is to be the defining characteristic of those who claim to follow Jesus. If the world looks at us, they should look at us and they might think we're crazy for believing some of the things that we believe because they don't understand. That's fine. They might think we're weird, right? And they'd be what? They'd be right, all right? But one thing they should look and say, those people are crazy and those people are weird, but no one loves people like they do. Right? No one loves each other. Man, they love each other so much. that I, I mean, I, don't, I, I struggle to believe this Jesus thing. I, I struggle to believe that, that Jesus died and rose again. I, I don't know if I get that, but man, I would love to have the love that they have, the care that they have for one another. And sadly, that's not always the case. And I think we're going to see in this passage one of the things that hinders that. But he says, love one another and work together, right? We have a purpose. We have a mission that God's given us. And and it's not a solo mission. Your giftedness, your calling from God, your purpose, we talked about in Ephesians 2.10, is not a solo purpose. It's to be part of his body, to be part of the church, and to work with others and to serve with others. And so Paul says, work together with one mind and one purpose. And then he gets, and as we talked about, yesterday, gospel-centered action, right? And so courageous faith requires gospel-centered action. And so as we think about that, Paul's, he's, he's going to show us in this passage about how that begins to be, to be worked out. So look at verse 3. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. 
And don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. And so Paul's going to lay out a challenge for the church to say that humility needs to be essential in our lives. He says, don't be selfish. And Paul has to say that because what are we naturally? Selfish. Who do you think about more than anyone else? Yourself. All right. It feels better now that we've all admitted that, right? It's kind of freeing. We have a natural tendency, all of us do, to think about ourselves more than others. So he says, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Right? That's one that probably some of us could take to heart. He says, instead be humble, thinking of others as better or more important than yourself. Right? That, that to understand the gospel, he says, is to understand that our lives are not more valuable than other lives, or that we should put others before ourselves. He says, don't look out only for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. Jesus elevated humility as the soil of virtue for our lives. And he says, don't, don't live for yourself. If we're going to live a courageous faith, right, if we're going to live out the call of God on our lives, this incredible call the gospel brings to our lives, we need humility. And not only do we need it, right, not only is it, is it important, but I want you to know that it, it is going to be a blessing to your life because the most certain pathway to a meaningless life is to live only for yourself. The most certain path to a meaningless life is to live only for yourself. I promise you, if you choose to live only for yourself and what you want and what you desire, and listen, society and culture will tell you that that's what you should live for. But God to the gospel calls us to live a life that's completely contrary to the culture around us. That's what Paul was trying to get the church in Philippi to understand, that the gospel meant a call to live distinctly different and other than the culture around them. right? Because we're now to live with the values of the culture of God's kingdom. Right? And God's kingdom often clashes with the kingdoms of this world and the values of this world. And so he says, live with humility. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. It's something we all need. Humility positions us to experience a life of meaning and purpose. If you want to experience meaning and purpose, you're going to find it actually through humility. Why? Because it helps us to be able to experience the presence of God. Right? We have to humble ourselves to come to God, to experience Him and to know Him. It, it, it puts us in a position to experience the power of God in our life. And you cannot live, you cannot live a courageous faith. You cannot live for God. You cannot serve Him in your own strength. You're not able. I'm not able. But you don't have to. The power of God is available to you and to me. And humility positions us for that, and it positions us to live for the purposes of God. So it positions us to experience His presence, His power, and His purposes. Right? God says in, uh, God's Word says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, it says, Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another. For God opposes the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. Right? So it says, we're to wear, we're to dress ourselves with humility and, and have humility towards one another. And then notice it says, God opposes. And literally, one of the most, uh, if, if you look at that word in the original language, it's the idea of, of stiff arming, of holding someone back. It says, God holds at a distance. He, he, it pushes God away from us. It says, He opposes the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. And so we need humility. Courageous faith requires gospel centered humility. And there isn't a better model for our humility than Jesus. Right? This is something that, that, that the Bible tells us to do and have, but it's something that Jesus actually showed us how to do. And in these next few verses, which are actually in the form of a hymn, it may have been an early hymn that the church sung, Paul's going to share through this hymn, through these words, how Jesus models humility. Look at verse 5 and 6. He says, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. For though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to, or some translations say to be grasped. So let's look at this. He says, you need to have the same attitude, right? the same mindset, the same way of thinking that Jesus had. And then he says, though he was God, right? when Jesus was on earth, he became fully man, but he was fully God. And he lived and walked among us, and he says, 
though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to, something to be taken advantage of. And so Paul says, think about Jesus, God, the creator, the sustainer, the giver of all life, comes to us in a human body. He had all the glory, he had all the power, and yet he didn't cling to it or use it as an advantage. And he did that to model humility for us. And he calls us, he says, as the church, as followers of Jesus, we're to have the same attitude, the same mindset that Jesus had. That we are not people who cling to our rights, but we're willing to give them up. Look at verse 7. It says, instead he gave up his divine privileges, and he took the humble position of a slave, and he was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Now think about that. Jesus laid aside his rights. He gave up his privileges. You know, we don't like to do that, do we? We, we like getting privileges, right? How many of you have ever enjoyed having some privileges that other people didn't have? Did it feel good, right? Maybe, maybe in, in your household, you know, if you're the older sibling, you got some privileges, right, that, that you're, you get to stay up later, you, and you're like, and you kind of flaunt that a little bit. Or maybe you're the younger sibling, and you got away with more than your older sibling got away with, right, because your parents just gave up, right? And you got some privileges that they didn't get, right? And we like getting privileges, but the gospel is a call to actually lay aside our rights to our privileges, to our way, to getting our way. And it says Jesus took the humble position of a slave, of a servant, and he was born as a human being. Listen, just the fact that Jesus became man, the fact that God became man, is an act of humility that we probably cannot even begin to wrap our minds around. Right? The, the, the reality of, of the God who is creator and infinite and sustainer and giver of all life, just him becoming human is an act of humility that, that would blow our minds. But not only did he become human, but it says in verse 8 that he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Jesus not only limited himself to humanity, but he submitted himself to the greatest act of injustice that has ever occurred in all of human history. Because nothing, nothing was ever more unjust than the cross. Nothing. The events leading up to the cross were unjust. He was betrayed by one of his followers, Judas. He was illegally put on trial at night. He was mocked and beaten and slapped and spit on. He was whipped nearly to the point of death itself, forced to carry his cross to the point of collapse, and then nailed to that cross where he died. Nothing was more unjust. And yet Jesus was there precisely because he chose to be, because of his love for you and his love for me and his love for a world that needed redemption and forgiveness. And Paul says the cross is not just a message of salvation, which it primarily is, but it's also a message of humility. You know, we get so caught up sometimes in our rights and getting our way, and that I deserve this and I deserve that. And Paul says we need to model Jesus and give up our rights. Instead of seeking to promote self, that we're to live for Jesus and we're to live for others. And that's the essence of humility. It's not, humility isn't thinking, oh, I'm a nobody, I'm nothing. No, you're a new creation in Christ, right? You have the righteousness of Christ. You are loved by your Father. You're a child of God and an heir to the kingdom of God, right? You need to be confident in your identity. But the, in that identity, knowing who you belong to and knowing who you, who, you, who you belong to positions you to say, Man, I'm a child of God. I'm an heir to his kingdom, and I don't have to cling to my rights. I don't have to strive. I don't have to get my own way because I belong to him. I belong to him. So instead of seeking to promote yourself and to place yourself above others, humility requires us to position ourselves under God. Verses 9 through 11, Paul says, Therefore God elevated him to the place of highest honor, and gave him a name that is above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Right? Jesus humbled himself, but his Father exalted him. And he is exalted now and for all of eternity. And, and the point I think that we would take away from this as our own lives is that we need to let God put us where he wants us. We don't have to promote ourselves, exalt ourselves, 
We let God take us and use us however, wherever He wants. He may put you in a position where you get a lot of esteem and a lot of accolades. Use that for His glory, but don't ever think it's about you. But let Him honor you, not yourself. And listen, it's extraordinarily freeing to live humbly. Because here's the thing, when it comes to courage, we don't have to try. We don't have to strap on our boots and muster up the courage to live for God. Right? When we walk humbly, God promises us His power and His presence in our life. So humility isn't looking down on yourself. It isn't thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Are you with me? Humility isn't thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. It's thinking about Jesus and others first. And Jesus is our ultimate model. The uncreated creator who came for us, who loved us, who gave himself for us, who died in our place and rose from the dead. And so our ultimate model of humility is Jesus. I just have a few questions because his attitude, his actions are our model for genuine humility. So here's a few questions for you that I want you to, to maybe write down, to think about. Am I competing for people's attention and approval? Am I competing for people? Am I looking for attention and approval? Now, we all need healthy amounts of approval in our life. I'm not, I'm not talking about that, but I'm talking about an unhealthy way where we're trying to get attention and approval. Second question, do I find it difficult to rejoice in the success of others? How do you feel when others get promoted? How do you feel when someone else gets the chair that you wanted in orchestra? How do you feel when someone else gets into the college that you wanted to get into? Third question, do I believe I'm superior to other people or groups of people? Do you think that you're better than other people or other groups of people, other ethnicities, other nations, people who are from different places? You know, sometimes people in the north think they're better than people in the south, right? And people in the south are all convinced that they're better than people in the north, right? And we get these, you know, and, and every region has its own it, you know, distinctiveness, but that's, that's just pride. Am I concerned for the needs of others? I just want to close thinking about the fact that not only do we have Jesus as an example, not only is Jesus our ultimate example, but God puts examples in our lives of people who walk humbly with Him. When I was a camper uh, here, my first year, 1995, that'll blow your mind a little bit, because you weren't born then, were you? My counselor invited a Chehi faculty member to come and uh, do our devotions with us that night. And we went down to some room in the, the building where the cafeteria is, and, and I remember going down the hallway. And that night, that faculty member shared Micah chapter 6, verse 8 with us. It said, He has told you, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you, but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. You know, I don't remember a lot of chapel messages from that year. I may have been asleep, I'm not sure, right? But there, there's not many memories of chapel. But I will remember that night the rest of my life. And the reason I was is because the man who shared with us was, he, he was a, a brilliant musician, extraordinarily gifted and talented. He was a, a man who was intellectually just far above most people. But it wasn't his talent or his intellect that really made the ultimate impact on people. He was also a man of genuine, genuine humility. And I remember him sharing this verse. He says, here's what God wants. He wants you to do justice, to do what's right, to love kindness, but to walk humbly with your God. And it was his humility that gave weight to his life. It was his humility that gave, that gave power to his life, and it gave weight to his words. A few years ago, his faith became sight. He's no longer with us. But his impact lives on. And I want to call you to the same level of humility. Pride is the carbon monoxide of sin. All right, you're familiar with carbon monoxide? Can you smell it? Can you see it? You don't know it's there. And unless you have a detection system, many people don't know, don't know it's there until when? Until it's too late. Yeah, it kills you. And pride is like that. Often when pride enters our life, it creeps in a little bit at a time, and we don't see it. Right? There was a king in the Bible named Uzziah. 
who was a godly man. He became king at 16 years old. How many of you would like to be king at 16, right? You're like, that'd be cool. I'd like to be in charge. We all think we want to be in charge, right? That life would be better. But he was a godly man who was extremely and wildly successful. But after his success came pride. And he took a position that only the priests were allowed to be. He went in to burn incense in the temple. And God sent 81 preachers to warn him, right? Don't do this. But he did it anyway. And God struck him with leprosy. And when he died, the only thing they put on his tombstone was he was a leper. Pride will destroy your life. So Jesus says that, the Bible says this, you must have the same attitude as Jesus Christ had. Listen, many of you, most of you, are more talented and more intelligent than many of your peers. And that can become a dangerous place for us. Because that is often the very thing that leads us to pride. The very gifts that God gave us, the intellect He gave us, the ability that He gave you, can become grounds for pride. And pride will destroy your life. It will destroy your ability to live for Jesus, to experience His presence and His power, and to live for His purposes. And I don't want that to be your story. I want your story to be a story of genuine humility, of walking humbly with your God. Would you let me pray for you this morning? Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness and your grace in our lives. And I thank you that when you sent your son Jesus to us and for us, that he demonstrated and modeled what humility looks like. Father, we confess this morning that, that we deal and struggle with pride. And I just pray that if, if someone's here, is, is this is a real issue in their life, that, that you would convict them of that and that you would humble them and help them to humble themselves before you and that they might experience the joy and the freedom that comes from humility. And I pray that all of us would see the value of walking in humility. So help us today to practice humility. Help us to practice it by looking out for others more than ourselves. Help us to, to put it into practice today that our faith would not just be something that we say, but it would be something that we do. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.